do want to say a certain gladly we won the Stanley Cup again for the for the city of Toronto. I certainly feel that they deserve it. They're wonderful fans, and I hope we can do it again next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. On November 8, 1924, in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, Johnny Bauer was born. The second of nine children, no brothers, eight sisters. When he was just 14, he lied about his age and enlisted in the army with the Queen's own Cameron Highlanders. During World War II, he would spend two years in England before returning home to Saskatchewan in 1944. 14 years later, on June 3, 1958, Johnny Bauer was claimed by the last place Maple Leafs from the Cleveland Barons in the AHL Interleague Draft. But he didn't want to go. I kept telling them I couldn't help them. But they warned me if I didn't sign, they would suspend me. That fall, after playing 12 years in the American Hockey League, the winningest goalie in AHL history would be in Maple Leaf, blue and white. At age 33, he was instantly the oldest player on the team. In fact, for every game of his 12 seasons in Toronto, he would always be the oldest on the team. And for his final 10 seasons, he was the oldest player in the league. Of course, Johnny preferred to play without the protection of a mask. At times, intentionally blocking shots with his face and thwarting oncoming attackers with his signature poke check before they could even begin their assault on the Toronto net. Johnny explained his style simply as this. I just made up my mind that I was going to lose my teeth and have my face cut to pieces. Johnny's career accomplishments are impressive and weave their way through one of the most beloved eras in the franchise's history. A four-time Stanley Cup champion, he would drink from the cup in 62, 63, and 64 when he told the Gardens fans after the final game that the city of Toronto deserves the Stanley Cup more than anybody else. Then in 1967, as part of the oldest team that has ever won, or likely ever to win the Stanley Cup, Johnny won his fourth. After 67, Johnny would suit up for three more seasons before retiring at age 45. Since then, he has filled the roles of goalie coach, practice goalie, scout, and for team Christmas parties, yes, Santa Claus. Along the way, Johnny has made more appearances in our community than any Maple Leafs player in history. He most certainly holds the record for standing ovations at Air Canada Centre. As engaged in his 94th year as he was when he arrived in Toronto in 1958, Johnny has always treated every fan as if they were the first that ever wanted to shake his hand. Always gracious, always wondering what all the fuss was all about. Johnny was elected to the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1976. His number one was raised to the rafters of Maple Leaf Gardens in 1995 and was permanently retired 21 years later. 2014, he became one of the inaugural members of Legends Row. And in our centennial season, he was selected seventh as a part of the 100 greatest Leafs in team history. King Clancy once said of his friend, Bauer is a great credit to the game. Of all the people who are in the Hall of Fame, there is no one more worthy than Johnny Bauer. He has been one of the most honest and conscientious players produced. He is in a class by himself as a person. There may not be a more loved Toronto Maple Leaf, nor a former player who loved them as much back. The first star, Johnny Bauer. Number one in your program for every game he ever played, Johnny will remain number one in the hearts of generations of Leafs fans forever. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your Master of Ceremonies, the voice of the Leafs, Joe Bowen. Welcome everyone. A very special day to honor a very special person. We join together today to celebrate the life of the great Johnny Bauer, a gentleman in the truest sense of the word, 
Johnny was beloved by so many, not only for his Hall of Fame credentials as a player, but also for his generosity of spirit, kindness, and passion for people. Johnny Bauer was my dad's favorite player. My dad played goal, I play goal, that was the easy part. While sitting on his lap watching Hockey Night in Canada, he would bellow, Holy Mackinac, did you see that save Johnny made? My dad was a general surgeon in Sudbury. He would play a big role in the Leafs' Stanley Cup victories of the 60s. You see, he successfully delivered 3,000 Sudburyans. He made only one mistake. His name was Eddie Shack. Johnny was my favorite player, too, but he was much more than that. Johnny Bauer was my hero, he was my idol, and later in life, my mentor, and most of all, my friend. I dreamt of playing goal for the Toronto Maple Leafs, maybe even taking over for Johnny when he retired at age 50 or 60. I first met Johnny when I was just 15 years of age, a year after my father had passed away. A great friend of Captain George Armstrong's, Jimmy Hines, brought my mother and I to my very first NHL game at the Gardens. We sat in the first row, right behind my idol, above the glass, and I thought we were going to be killed. The Leafs were playing Bobby Hull and the Chicago Blackhawks. I wasn't wearing a mask either. After the game, the Chief took me into the dressing room. I met Frank, Davey, Timmy, Carl, Allen, Red. I just wanted to meet one Leaf, my hero. When I finally did, I turned into Ralph Cramden of the Honeymooners. <laughs> George told Johnny I was a goalie from Sudbury. I shook hands with him, and my hand was immediately buried in this enormous paw. He asked how my season was going. I think I said, good. I lied. Our goalie was terrible. I dropped the pen and program I had ready for the autograph, and he graciously picked it up, and he painstakingly wrote, Johnny Bauer, number one. I don't think I even congratulated him on the victory. I left the room as red-faced as a goal light. I put Johnny Bauer on a hero's pedestal that no mortal really could have lived up to. And then years later, while broadcasting for the Sudbury Walls and then the Toronto Maple Leafs, I met Johnny Bauer, the man, once more. I quickly realized I hadn't put him on a pedestal high enough. Johnny Bauer was easily the nicest, most generous, most humble man I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. He was so generous with his time and encouragement for a young broadcaster trying to make his way in the NHL, we quickly became friends. But I most certainly wasn't alone. Nancy Bauer, early on in their 69-year marriage, along with children John Jr., Cindy, and Barbara, learned that they would have to share Johnny Bauer. They would have to share him with his teammates. They would have to share him with the media. And most certainly, they were going to have to share him with the fans. He always had time for an autograph, a story, a conversation. And lately, when cell phones arrived for a photograph with the Hall of Fame goalie, and I swear that John Bauer in his later years became a chick magnet. Every woman in Toronto has a picture of her and Johnny Bauer. Young kids would rush to get his signature. Johnny Bauer. Johnny Bauer. H-H-O-F-76. I have a millennial. I don't think he takes cursory writing. He could read John Bauer's autograph. They never got to see him play, the youngsters, but their fathers and grandfathers had informed them that they were in the presence of greatness. We lost John Bauer in his 94th year last week. We will all cherish every memory he produced over that span, whether it was on or off the ice. His playing career made him a Hall of Famer, but it is what he has given back to this game, this organization, and certainly this city since, that has made him a legend. It is only fitting that we say goodbye to Johnny today as a community, one in which he gave so much back to over his years. 
You know, there may be only one Johnny Bauer Hall of Fame goalkeeper, but there are three Johnny Bowers. I would like to introduce to you the grandson of Johnny Bauer, John Bauer III, who will represent the family. Thank you very much, Joe. Hello, friends. It is my honor and privilege today to speak on behalf of my family. As Joe mentioned, I'm John Bauer III. I like to joke that there's not a lot of originality in my family when it comes to naming their firstborn males. But it is a tribute to my grandfather's namesake. We thought that we understood the impact of Grandpa, or JB as we like to call him, that he had on so many people. But that has changed over the past week with the outpouring of love and support from Maple Leafs and hockey fans from around the world. We have been overwhelmed by your emails, your tweets, phone calls, and letters. Thank you. JB was a very humble man, and he had a tough time understanding why he was so popular. In fact, he'd be probably be embarrassed by today's ceremony. He said so much, as so much to me, when we were in a bus driving from the Bell Center to Jean Béliveau's funeral a few years ago in Montreal. But colonist Steve Simmons summed it up best this week, saying that, and I quote, Johnny didn't need words. Rather, it was through his handshake, a smile, a touch of the shoulder, a joke, and with a pocket filled of photographs that he proudly autographed for anyone who asked that best explains the allure of JB. As we celebrate his life today, I'd like to share some of the things that made him so, so special to us. The first thing is that Grandpa understood the importance of being kind. It is the simplest, yet greatest value a person can possess. You can demonstrate kindness by looking someone in the eyes and smiling. This shows interest and creates a link between people. Mary Beth Trendos wrote to the family after JB's passing and shared a story of how she met Grandpa when her brother was playing for Colgate University. She says that she cannot remember anything in particular about their conversation other than she appreciated their time together and that Grandpa gave her a Maple Leafs pin that she cherishes today. She said that she has kept that in her, her jewelry box for the last 26 years, waiting for the right time to pass it on to his, her son. She decided to give it to him on Boxing Day. So a smile and a little kindness can leave a lasting impression. A lot of you have been writing about your experiences with Grandpa and how his face lit up when he was talking with you. This has brought smiles to our faces and bringing comfort and warmth to our souls. JB also taught us that everyone should have the ability to laugh in order to remain healthy and happy. And Grandpa could laugh at pretty much any situation, especially himself. Even after he'd fallen off a ladder, the roof of the cottage, or even out of his bed. I'm quite serious about this. It seemed like every summer he fell off the roof or the ladder at the cottage. He used to love this rickety old wood ladder that everybody said, you got to get rid of it. It wasn't a four-legged ladder, it was a three-legged ladder that he built. So one day he got up on it and he fell, breaking his fall and his ribs by landing on our outdoor wooden shower. He was 75 at the time. And what did he do? He got up, brushed himself off, and he laughed. When he fell off the ladder in his 80s, trying to remove a wasp nest at the house, landing in the hedges and cutting himself up while Grandma was away visiting her sister in Saskatoon, he couldn't stop laughing when he was telling me about that story a few hours later. One might say he had more lives than a cat, and those lives extended to others. See, there was a time that he asked me to help him hook up his... Uh, new ceiling fan in his bedroom and he turned the power on as I was connecting the wires. I fell off the ladder, he laughed, and after a moment of disbelief so did I. When he knocked an entire can of paint onto my mother's new carpet while we were painting the ceiling, what did he do? You guessed it, he laughed. Then he came up with this brilliant plan to recycle as much paint as possible from the carpet, including all the little uh, 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 
bits that were in the carpet and continued to paint. And what happened when Dad came home and was aghast at the paint job? JB smiled, said, you get what you pay for, and he laughed. There was a time that he got stuck in a kid's water tube in Florida because he wanted to make my cousins laugh during their winter vacation. He thought he'd pass right through it. It didn't turn out exactly as he had planned. Oh, he went through most of it all right, but his arms got caught, and he, wouldn't, he couldn't get it off. So Grandma had to come out with a pair of scissors to get him out of that tight situation. He'd take out his dentures, put on Grandma's one-piece bathing suit, her sun hat, and walk around the cottage to make anyone laugh who was in the vicinity. And the laughs were plenty with Johnny Bauer. Something that always made Grandpa laugh and smile were animals. And this is why the family has been asking for donations to be made to the, to the Mississauga Humane Society, because Grandpa loved animals and the feeling was mutual. He also knew that a dog was the greatest friend one could have. In Johnny Bauer Park in Mississauga, there are cards from local dog owners and the dogs, uh, as well as dog biscuits abound. And the reason why was because Grandpa would greet every dog in the neighborhood with a cookie, and dogs knew it. When they saw his garage door open, they would stop at the bottom of the driveway and wait for him to come out with their treat. In our family, the dogs had the privilege of sitting next to Grandpa during dinner, much to the chagrin of my parents, my aunts and uncles, and my grandmother. Here's why. JB would encourage the dogs to sit beside him and put their heads in his lap so he could feed them during the meal. Sunday dinner, Easter dinner, Thanksgiving, Christmas, it didn't matter as long as his four-legged friend uh, shared his, what was on his plate. He tried to make all of us believe that he was doing nothing. He'd take a bite of food from his fork or his spoon and then put, quickly put it in his mouth. While chewing, he would go for a second serving. But this one would just slightly slide between his elbow and his body, and we would hear the dogs going. He continued that until about the third or fourth bite when Grandma would ask him to stop feeding the dog, and what happened? We all laughed. Grandpa and Grandma live in Mississauga in a home that backs on to a marsh. They were the first people to move into their neighborhood, and the builder had huge piles of hay that they could use to insulate the cement that they were pouring in colder weather. And a couple of geese decided that it was an appropriate place to make their nests. Grandpa decided that it would be nice to buy some bird feed for the geese. Now, you might know that Canadian geese have this uncanny knack of reprodu reproducing at an alarming rate, and they're also creatures of habit. So four birds in the first year became almost 40 the next year, and JB just kept buying more and more bird food feed. It got to the point he would open the back door of his house, and the geese on the other side of the marsh would start swimming across the, the pond to meet him to be fed. They'd waddle up, they'd get fed, and then the ducks started following them, and every other uh, type of wildlife in the area. That continued until Grandma suggested that Grandpa feed the waterfowl down at the lake because they didn't necessarily have a backyard as so much as a bird sanctuary. But Grandpa always loved those birds and, when, and appreciated it when they came for a visit. He grew up in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, a town made up of European immigrants, Cree and Métis people. He came from a mixed British-Ukrainian family, so it is no surprise that he made friends from all walks of life. He and George Armstrong were an inseparable road couple for almost a decade, despite JB liking the hotel room warm and Chief liking it ice cold. They were the best of friends. Speaking of our First Nations, did you know that JB was named an honorary member of the Union of Ontario Indians in 2007? As Grand Council Chief Patrick Matabe said last week, and I quote, Johnny Bauer was a longtime supporter of the Anishinaabek Nation seventh generation charity one that raises funds to improve the quality of life for its citizens. The Anishinaabek Nation gave him the name Johnny with the heart as big as an eagle's wingspan bower. It was a tremendous and aptly named honor. Grandpa was also a big booster of female hockey dating back to the 1970s, coaching many young female players throughout the years and encouraging the development of the sport in the Canadian Women's Hockey League. Legendary women's hockey player and Hockey Night in Canada commentator Cassie Campbell Pascoe posted a wonderful tweet last week describing JB as a kind man and thanking him for always standing up for the women's game. She added that he was an amazing individual who made everyone feel like they were his best friend. For JB, everyone had the right to play the game of hockey and to live long and active lives, a mantra that he lived every day. On a more personal note, my wife and children are francophones, and JB learned some French expressions, and not the ones that he learned while playing against the Canadians. 
to make them feel welcome in our family. When my father-in-law, Jacques Gravel, and his brothers played road hockey, there were two choices back in Montreal. You were either Jacques Plante or Johnny Bauer. And Jaco, being the keener that he was, always chose to be Johnny Bauer. And it's ironic that his family is now a part of ours. And every time my grandfather was in Montreal, Habs fans treated him like he was one of theirs. Alors, par respect, j'aimerais dire quelques mots en français pour remercier le club de hockey canadien ainsi que leurs partisans pour leur appui depuis mardi dernier. De grands rivaux sur la glace, mais des amis pour toujours à l'extérieur de la patinoire. The Habs and JB are linked forever as rivals on the ice and friends off of it. Serving his country has been a huge part of Grandpa's life, and he's done it at every opportunity, from the Second World War, where he enlisted as a minor, to donning skates, to hit the ice with a bunch of kids in community rinks, to giving a lunchtime talk at my elementary school in, during the 1988 Olympics, he could always be counted to lend a helping hand to community causes. He has worked with Peel Partners for a Drug-Free Community, Mississauga Rotary Club, Knights of Columbus, Easter Seals, and the former Mississauga Ice Dogs. A Mississauga Breakfast Club is named in his honor, and for the past, past 14 years, he has proudly served as the only honorary chief of in the history of the Peel Regional Police Service. In this role, he has attended hundreds of events to promote safety while serving as an ambassador between the police and the public. In recent years, Grandpa worked with the Canadian Armed Forces to raise the spirits of our troops, as well as to fund as to raise funds for the Wounded Warriors Canada program by the Heroes Hockey Challenge. He also spent many Remembrance Days visiting with veterans, and when he traveled the country to attend fundraisers, he would often leave anonymous donations to local charities. It was just a part of his nature to give back. Which brings us to what Grandpa valued the most, and that's family. And when I say family, I mean family in all of its forms. We have two families, the Bauer bloodline, and then there's our greater family, and that includes everyone here today. When the day was done, Grandpa would come home to be with Grandma and his three children, John Jr., Cindy, and Barb. They were what kept him grounded. And when I came along in 1974, he had a whole new generation of Bowers to take under his wing and to guide. We now count eight grandchildren, six great-grandchildren, all of whom are here with us in Toronto this week. Also with us is Grandpa's nephew, Harold Batting, who flew in from BC to celebrate with us on behalf of his mother, my great aunt Anne, who is 99 years of age, watching in today. Each summer between 1954 and six, excuse me, 1958 and 64, JB and Grandma would pack up the family and head back to Saskatchewan, where they would hold various jobs and own several businesses. My dad was employed one summer as a potato peeler for Bowers Big Boy Restaurant. Even though he ended up eating a lot of the profits in the form of cherry pie, cherry pie filling. But while working at the restaurant, he got to do what so, young, so few young people get to do, and that is go to work with his parents every day. Back in Toronto, every, at every, he was at every one of Barbie and Cindy's skating competitions and would bring the family to the gardens to skate during the holidays. He would eventually partner with Cindy, who was a world class power skating instructor, to form the Johnny Bauer Goaltending and Skating Efficiency School. Even while playing for the Leafs, JB and Grandma would adopt my dad and aunt's friends as members of the Bauer clan. One year, they threw a community Halloween party for all the children in the neighbor neighborhood of Etobicoke. He never wanted a child to go without. Now, I mentioned a little early, earlier how Grandpa and Grandma would welcome people to the extended family, and one of the best examples is Margot Duncan, the children's babysitter. Margot, to this day, is a regular at Bauer Christmas and birthday parties because to us it wouldn't be a holiday without the members of our extended family. JB also found enough room in his heart to welcome my mother Janice and her family to the fold. You see, my mom's fa father passed away when she was young and once she and my father started dating, JB took a shining to her. So much so that her sister and her spent a lot of time at 80 Summit Crest Drive and at the cottage. JB became their adopted father and even now, my Aunt Sue still calls him dad and my cousins call him Grandpa. It's the same with Cindy's husband, Bill, who was welcomed to the family more than 30 years ago, and our Aunt Barb's husband, Dean, and his two children. He had an unlimited amount of love in his heart and was willing to welcome anyone to his family. And although our immediate family is relatively small, we are members of a much larger family, that of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Every one of us grandchildren has attended the Leafs' Christmas party where Santa Claus bared a striking resemblance to a certain former goalie. 
My brother Bruce and I would sometimes go to practice with injured Leafs players when the team was on the road and JB served as practice goalie. Talk about an experience, a teenage kid and his brother going to Maple Leaf Gardens to practice with NHL players in the midst of a season. These are memories that no one can ever take away from us. Yes, players and administrators and owners have changed over the past 60 years, but there is one commonality for us Bowers. We are a part of the Leafs Nation. It is the passion that unites us all. Before I finish, I would like to thank the Toronto Maple Leafs and Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, especially Brendan Shanahan, uh, the events team, and Drew Rogers from the Leafs Alumni Association for their efforts to make today po possible. Thank you to Coach Babcock and the Maple Leafs players for joining us in today's ce uh, celebration. We wish you much success this season. As Grandpa would say, we know this is the year. You have an angel watching down from the rafters of the Air Canada Centre who will be enjoying every minute of your chase for the Stanley Cup. We'd also like to thank Debbie Sittler and Wendy McCurry from the NHL Alumni Association for your help over the past 10 days, as well as the tremendous support of the National Hockey League. Thank you, Mr. Bettman, for attending today. And we'd like to thank all of the alumni, the Leafs and the National Hockey League alums who are here today, especially those who will be speaking uh, later on. I would also like to thank every one of you in attendance here at Air Canada Centre and those of you watching it on television. You have been a part of Grandpa's journey from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you for the love and that you have expressed to us. To sum up, JB taught us that it is more rewarding to help others and to give than to receive the glory because at the end of the day, we are measured by the impact we make more so than the awards we garner. He is someone we all admire and should aspire to be. One last thing, thank you, and could we get one last Go Leafs Go for Johnny? Everybody? Thank you. John Bauer grew up in the Depression. He knew the value of a dollar. 1962, they're playing the Chicago Blackhawks in the Stanley Cup final. Bobby Hull takes a slap shot. John Bauer does the splits. And he comes up, and he's got an injured groin. Punch Imlach looks down at the net. And he sees Bauer rather uncomfortable. He sends the chief, the captain, over to see if he's all right. George got over there. Johnny said, yeah, I'm fine. Goes back to the bench, Chief says, he says he's fine. Punch says, I don't think he is. Tell him to come to the bench. Got over there, he says, he wants you to come to the bench. I'm not coming out. Skates back, says, George, Punch, he's not coming out. Tell him if he doesn't come out, I'm fining him 25 bucks. <whistles> John's at the bench. <laughs> Found out that Don Simmons was a pretty good goaltender, too. And the Leafs went on to win the Stanley Cup. Thank you very much, John the Third, for those wonderful remarks and uh, the recollections of what you and your family have in memories of your grandfather. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to welcome to the stage now the President and Alternate Governor of your Toronto Maple Leafs, Mr. Brendan Shanahan. Chances are, if you grew up in Toronto and you found yourself in a hockey game, whether it was on the ice or on the road, and you found yourself in net, and a forward was coming down on you and had his head down, and as he approached you, you lunged out on your belly and poke checked the puck or the tennis ball to safety. Someone in the game or someone watching the game yelled, Johnny Bauer. This occurred while Johnny was playing. This occurred even in the decades that Johnny had stopped playing. 
That's the legend that he was. Growing up, we all knew of the legend and the name Johnny Bauer. Three and a half years ago, when I joined his team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, I was lucky enough to get to know the man. Joe had spoken earlier about having heroes. It really is incredible when the legends or the heroes that you see from afar and then you get to meet up close actually surpass the level that you already had them placed on. And Johnny was that kind of a man. You've heard it before and I'll say it again. Generous, soft-spoken, warm and welcoming. There was, I'm sure Johnny had an ego, but he didn't show it. There was no entitlement in Johnny Bauer. And it's interesting too, a man that I met in his 90s, and it just seemed wrong to call him John. He had that youthfulness and that boyish quality that he was always Johnny. But getting to know him away from the rink, I'm still dumbfounded and curious. And we will hear from his teammates, and they will, I'm sure, enlighten us a little bit about some of the specifics of what it was like to play with him. There had to be an internal furnace, a fire burning inside him. It still amazes me. It is incredible to think that at 33, when most hockey players are hanging up their skates, he started his NHL career with the Toronto Maple Leafs. And in 12 years, he built a Hall of Fame career, which included two Vesnas and four Stanley Cups. Just think about that for a while. We tell these stories, and sometimes we, we have to step back and imagine if that were happening today. It's an incredible story. And I've seen videos recently of him helping a Montreal Canadian who had crashed into his net get untangled from the net. I've seen even Gordy Howe put his arm around him after just losing the Stanley Cup to Johnny Bauer and the Maple Leafs. That's what people thought of him. In that amount of time, he built that much respect and friendship, not just with his teammates, but with his adversaries as well. And if you talk to players, and if you talk to them about what's most important to them, you'll hear a lot of different things from different players. But one thing you'll really hear often, very consistent, especially as you approach retirement or after you're retired, players will talk about how they want to be remembered. What's most important to most of them is they want to be the kind of person that was remembered by their teammates as somebody that you wanted to be on the ice with. For those of you that were lucky enough to have played in the NHL, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's nowhere to hide in the NHL. Some people say the NHL can build character, others say it reveals character. Well, Johnny Bauer was the kind of person that every teammate wanted to have on the ice with him. He was really a gentle warrior. And I think about our current players right now as well, or really anybody that was fortunate enough to have played in the NHL. What a blueprint that this man has laid out for all of us here in the city of Toronto. What it was like to be a professional athlete, but also more importantly, what it was like to be a professional athlete away from the game, after the game. What an incredible person. Nancy, the entire Bauer family, on behalf of our current players, on behalf of our alumni, coaching staff, our management staff, and everyone in our ownership as well. We just want to thank you for sharing with us your husband, your father, your grandfather, and your great-grandfather with us for so many nights. Since 1958, he has never not been a Maple Leaf. And we want to thank you for everything that he's done, not just for us, but the NHL 
the game of hockey in the city of Toronto. Johnny Bauer was loved. He, was, he, will, he will be de dearly missed. And he'll never be forgotten. Thank you very much, Brandon. While Johnny was busy stopping pucks at one end of the rink, our next speaker was busy putting them in. 275 of them while he was a teammate of John Bauer, and they would play for 10 seasons together, drinking from the Stanley Cup on four occasions. Would you please welcome the first of a series of teammates, the Big M, Frank Mahovlich. and the Bauer family. I want to thank you so much for letting my family, my wife Marie and myself, being friends of Johnny's and the, and the Bauer family all these years. We thought, thought so highly of them. It was 60 years ago when I first met Johnny Bauer. He got traded from the Cleveland Barons to the Toronto Maple Leafs and we were at training camp in 1958. I don't know why, but I can remember things that happened 60 years ago, and my wife will tell me something tomorrow or yesterday, and I won't remember it. But it, anyways, I listened to Johnny, and in those days, uh, we had to have a summer job to make ends meet. So Johnny was up at uh, Prince Albert, I believe, in Saskatchewan, and uh, made hamburgs. So here we are at training camp, and we were telling each other stories of the summer, and Johnny was telling me how to make hamburgers. And he says, look, Frank, he says, you, you make these things, he says, you get some breadcrumbs and you fill half of that hamburger with breadcrumbs. He says, you make a better profit. <laughs> it's funny, when I go to make my hamburgers for my grandchildren now up at the cottage this year, I'll remember to put the breadcrumbs in there. But anyways, Johnny was such a wonderful man. We've got so many stories. One thing I couldn't understand. Uh, my wife and I were on a trip once and two people from Cleveland was there and I told him that I played hockey for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He says, oh, there's where the China Wall is. And I wondered, what the heck are they talking about? And when he was in Cleveland, they nicknamed him the China Wall. And that kind of bothered me all these years, you know. So finally, after my career was over, Marie and I started to, uh, to plan a trip to go to China. And sure enough, we went, uh, we went to China, and I thought, gee, that's where the China Wall is. I'll go find out why they call Bauer the China Wall. And sure enough, uh, I got to, to uh, um, uh, China and uh, went up and uh, saw this China Wall and started to walk and walk and walk. And after a couple of miles, I said, that's enough, Marie. We'll turn around and we'll go back. But I got the answer. The reason they called Johnny the China Wall because he was one of a kind. Thank you very much. I told you about uh Johnny's frugality? Well, he knew the value of a dollar. One year, the Leafs were in training camp in Peterborough, and Nancy had just gotten a brand new convertible. Beautiful machine. Needed a paint job. John went all over Toronto, looking for the deal that he could get. He finally found a guy in Peterborough that it would do it for about $25 less. Great idea, they were going to be there from Monday to Friday, drop the car off on Monday, pick it up on Friday, drive home, brand new paint job. Things looked great. Told George about it. That was a mistake. 
drove the car up, brought it to the body shop. Guy says, no problem, I'll drop it off at the uh, golf club, because you guys are playing golf on Friday, and I'll leave the keys under the mat. Perfect. John goes out, plays golf, comes back, he's looking around in the, in the parking lot, can't find his car. George says, there it is. It is camouflage. Pink, blue, aquamarine, turquoise, whatever color you could imagine on it. George sa and John says, what am I going to do with this? George says, no problem, I'll drive it for you. He gets in, John's hunched down in the seat trying to hide, and there's Chief bellowing as he goes by. John Bauer's car, Hall of Fame goalie right here. <laughs> Had to bring it back the next week, get the car painted again. But that's the way he was. And that's the way his teammates appreciated him. Thank you very much, Frank. As a 19-year-old rookie in 1964, our next speaker joined the Leafs dynasty. They'd already won three Stanley Cups, but mentored by veteran leaders like John Bauer, 21 years his senior, he developed into a key two-way player for the Maple Leafs in the 60s and the 1970s. His 16 years with the Leafs ranks him third all-time. Would you please welcome Mr. Ron Ellis. Thank you very much, Joe. And, and first of all, thank you to all in attendance, all of you being here today to celebrate a life, the life of my teammate, my friend, and my mentor. As Joe said, I joined the Leafs in 1964. They had just won three Stanley Cups in a row. And they were a very close-knit group. And I said to myself, how am I going to fit in? I was quite concerned. My concerns were unfounded, though, because this group of grizzled veterans welcomed me to the fold. I do recall Johnny's sincere kindness. You're going to hear that throughout the afternoon. After a practice, John would give a little nod to me. After a game, it might just be a, a little hand gesture. But I think what he was saying to me is, keep going, kid. You're doing OK. His lovely Nancy came alongside of my wife, Jan. We were dating at the time. And she had Jan sit beside her and Andrew Kelly, she learned from the best. Thank you again, Nancy. <clears throat> More than ever, I realized today how fortunate I was to be a teammate of JB. Being on the ice with him, practicing with 10 future Hall of Famers, Wow, it was awesome. A pass from Kelly or Mahovlich, trying to get around Bobby Bond. <laughs> Dreams come true. And then there was Bauer. And as Brendan alluded to, the poke check. Some people ask me, who was the toughest goalie you ever played against? I said, Johnny Bauer in practice. <laughs> Early in my career, we had a team scrimmage at the end of practice. And I'm coming down the right side and cutting in on Johnny. And I said, I got this. Just a little move here, a little move there, a little fake there. And all of a sudden, the puck is in one corner. And I'm in a heap in the other corner. The dreaded poke check. I was talking to Ivan Cronoy a few minutes ago, and I said, Ivan, I think you're on the film clip today. He got hit by the poke check. 
After a couple of these incidents, I, uh, I wisely decided that, okay, from now on, I'm just going to shoot the puck at Johnny and give him a wide berth. Once in a while, I would go into the corner and just fall down out of respect for him. Why the poke check in a scrimmage, a team scrimmage? Johnny practiced the way he played the game. It kept him sharp mentally, physically, so whenever he was called upon, he was ready to go in the net. Being a teammate of Johnny's in 67, on the 67 Cup team, was certainly the highlight of my Leaf career. Our veterans certainly wanted to win the Cup that year. It was the last year of the six-team league. Expansion was looming. The guys knew there were going to be changes on the roster in 68. The over-the-hill gang were outstanding. Keon's exceptional play earned him the Conn Smythe Trophy. But however, no one wanted that fourth cup more than Johnny Bauer. I watched him come back from injuries during the playoffs against the Hawks and the Canadians to win a big game for us. This speaks to Johnny's toughness, his tenacity, and his commitment to the team. And folks, his approach to the game never changed until he retired. After retirement, uh, Johnny continued to work for the Leafs. We know that. But he also had now had time to participate in his second love, supporting charities. No one has given back more to his community or helped raise more money for various charities than Johnny Bauer. Thankfully, he even made time to support charity events that his teammates were involved in. When Johnny was 85 years young, he agreed to join me and some other alumni on a BC fishing trip that was organized as a fundraiser for the Hockey Hall of Fame. One morning, Johnny was a little late getting down for breakfast, so I went up to his room. He had the covers pulled right up to his neck. He said, Ronnie, he's one of the few people who called me Ronnie, he said, Ronnie, I think I got chilled a little bit on the water yesterday. However, if you need me to host your guys, I'm ready. Loyal to a T. Always ready to go that extra mile at any charity event he attended. And I saw him do that on many, many occasions. I said to Johnny, all I need you to do today, Johnny, is rest. We can fish tomorrow. As you look uh, up in the rafters, uh, you, we have some wonderful new banners of the Toronto Maple Leafs players who've had their jerseys retired. Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, I think, made a wonderful decision when they decided to donate the older jerseys to the hometown of those players. This past March, I had the opportunity to represent Johnny in his hometown, Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. As the banner was unveiled very slowly, a jam-packed arena for the Raiders game gave Johnny a five-minute standing ovation. He definitely remains Prince Albert's favorite son. Johnny III uh, was being interviewed earlier this week, and he provided the words that I had been searching for when I was trying to put some thoughts together for today. And it was this. Johnny considered it a privilege and not a right to be a Toronto Maple Leaf. 
gratitude is what drove him to become the best he could be. I think that's the answer, Brendan. As a result, teammates, opponents, hockey fans across our nation witnessed a wonderful man with a huge heart excel at his craft. Till we meet again, John, you're in my thoughts. Johnny was often throwing anything he could, including his face, into pucks to prevent them from going into the net. Our next speaker was routinely shutting down the opponent's top scores to limit the amount of rubber that John Bauer was going to see. You know, this organization recently went through its top 100 players, and this gentleman was recognized as the greatest Leaf of all time. I'm going to correct that just for today. He is the greatest Leaf of all time who didn't wear goal pads. Would you please welcome Mr. David Keon? stand before you today joining you as we celebrate John's long, wonderful life. I want to begin by recognizing and respect, respectfully embracing John's beloved wife, Nancy, his children, John Jr., Cindy, and Barbara, his eight grandchildren and 16 great-grandchildren. Collectively, we were always the love of his life. I first met John when I was a junior playing for St. Michael's Majors. I had admired him and his goaltending from afar, and it was such a thrill to meet him. Then just two years later, we were teammates with the Leafs, and then we became teammates for life. Over the next nine years, I learned many things from John. I learned patience, perseverance, endurance, resolve. How? Here's how. He played minor league hockey for 13 years before he got his real chance with the Leafs. Think about that for a second. 13 years. He was 33 before he became our regular goaltender, and then he played for us for over 10 years. Our team in the 60s sought glory. We had guts. We had determination. We played for each other, and we won four Stanley Cups. John was a huge reason for all of those victories, as he actually became the face of the Maple Leafs. I still remember, back in 1964, John made a breathtaking save against Larry Jeffries of the Red Wings in game six of the finals. A save at the start of the third period that kept it a one goal game. We tied it later, and then Bob Bond scored the winner in overtime on a broken leg. In sports, as in life, everyone remembers the heroic moment, in this case, an overtime goal. But only teammates remember the save that got us to overtime. That save, as much as the goal, if not more, got us back to Toronto, where John shut out the wings 4 nothing to win our third cup in a row. I have always thought we played to win the cup. That was why we played. John would certainly agree, although you'd never hear this from him. His road to the Maple Leafs and the Four Cups was much bumpier, much harder, and much longer than many of us. And yet, he became the centerpiece of our team. Winning the cup takes heart, but John was our soul. I'd like to end on a personal note, if I may. Uh, John was retired in 1970, 
and he was uh, the goalie coach, and he would come to practice and take part in practice. I think he was hoping that if something happened to the goaltend, one of the goaltenders, they'd sign him and he'd be the backup. <laughs> one Sunday morning, I was hurt, and on Sunday morning, the players who were hurt came down to skate, and John was there, and I brought my son David, who was 10 years old. And after we had finished our practice, I brought him out on the ice, and John stayed. And David took a shot, his first shot, and he scored. And 20 minutes later, we were still playing, and David still had one goal. Later, I asked John about my son's goal. I let him have one, David, because he's your son, he said. But one was all he was going to get. <laughs> Three more things. John's love for his family was non-negotiable. Two, my teammates to a man all loved John and he loved us back, all of us. Three, he loved playing for the Maple Leafs and for the millions of Leaf fans across the country and all fans loved him back. In over 100 years of Toronto Maple Leaf hockey, that is the most sincere hat trick. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you for coming down today to honor and remember our very good friend, Johnny Bauer. The respect and admiration for Johnny is obvious and listening not only to his family, but to his teammates, uh, you also feel the outpouring of support from the fans in this city and all over the world during the past week. It's not often that you find someone that is loved so dearly by so many, and at the same, loves others so dearly himself. Nancy, I don't speak Ukrainian. I grew up in a Ukrainian neighborhood. I don't have a Ukrainian poem. I have an Irish one. May the road rise to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. May the rains fall upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hands. God bless you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you for attending today and celebrating the life of Johnny Bauer. This concludes today's event. For those of you on the floor, please exit through the 122 VOM. For those in bowl seats, please exit through the main gate one entrance. <laughs>